Today I wanted to talk a little bit about designing a monster and I just wanted to run through a, a single example and uh, go over some concerns about how you might uh, want to do this. So remember that when we go through this design process there's basic shapes to keep in mind. You, know, you have your arcs, your circles, your triangles, your rectangles, and you know then you have your mixtures of them you can arc out triangles you can arc out boxes and so on and uh, generally speaking you're not going to necessarily use a complete circle you might um, but usually you use it to modify something so what i was kind of thinking was i would take sort of a prehistoric skeleton and build on it so what i what i first do is, um, and I drew this from a reference originally, but I'm kind of going out of my head and from notes at this point, is I'll first kind of sketch out the overall skeleton of this creature and notice the forms that I'm kind of using are, are sort of triangular or boxy modified with arcs. When you're drawing something organic, um, you know, this is a robot, right? These kinds of things are robotic. So when you want to draw a monster, you're going to draw things more with more curves and more arcs. And what I did, what I want to do in the beginning is just kind of get comfortable with this particular form. And I want to like sort of just learn about the reference that I'm using. And so what I want to do is sort of stick close to the reference at first. I don't want to drift too far um, because I'm just kind of figuring out how the joints work, where they swell, and so on, and how much tail there is there, maybe find an eye socket, um, and maybe begin to just elaborate a little bit on where you might find some structure there. Then that's kind of like my stage one, right? It's kind of sticking close to the reference. And it's not great, right? It's not very monstrous. It's very basic. Um, the next thing I want to do is think about well, what kind of shape do I want to squeeze this guy into? So I was thinking something sort of uh, triangular would be good. I don't think I want to use something that's that's strictly perfectly triangular. He kind of naturally has a triangular shape to him, and there's this slight arc about it. So I think what I could do is I can modify this slightly and force him into a little bit of an arc. So I think what I might do is is do this kind of thing and force him into this shape. And I think this is kind of stage two, is to give the monster or creature some kind of attitude, all you have to do is, is force him to fit the boundaries of a particular shape, and then it's gonna take on the attitude of that shape. So this shape has a natural attitude that is distinct from this triangular shape. So these are two different kind of things, two different kind of effects. Um, you know, this is kind of very sort of race car feeling, and this kind of has more of an organic but still pointed kind of feel to it. So what I'm going to do is take this this um, hip joint, kind of start here, and force that hip joint along this curve, right? So that I kind of hit or get near that that curve each time. And I can use the tail to kind of stick out from that, I do want like a short little stubby tail for this guy. And then I can drift in and out of this, this contour as necessary. And then I'm going to get down to the rib cage. And start to connect that to the hip. And then I'm going to start to figure out where these joints are and how I might make them work in the end. And I've got the shoulder blade right here simple organic triangle 
and then I'm going to build the arm off of that. Figure out where the foot's going to be. And then here, I'm kind of going to wind up driving the head to the ground, basically. So now that I've forced this guy into, the sh into this particular shape, there's a lot more character that's going on with it. Um, you know, it's got more of an attitude now, and I think that was kind of what was missing in sort of stage one. So what I'm thinking about is um, developing this idea slowly and, and in stages, right, and getting more and more comfortable with the idea. I think the more times you draw a form, um, the more comfortable you get with it, and the more comfortable you're going to get distorting it. Now there's some concerns. I think for stage one, stage two, you want to stay small. Because small makes you think about the shape, right? The big shape. But when it comes time to start distorting and moving into stage three where you're thinking, well, how do I make this into a monster? How do I make this creepy? How do I get some kind of concept out of it? Uh, I want to increase the size. So big, that means I can get into the detail, right? I have more physical room to work. So what I want to do is go through this process again, you know, force this big shape, but I'm going to increase the scale of the monster, right? And it doesn't matter whether you're doing this analog or digital, um, the process is basically, is basically the same. Um, I might even make this modify the overall shape just slightly so I get uh, the peak of the body in a different point. So I think what I'm going to do is begin the same way, basically. Just begin with this this uh, big hip joint. I think I'm going to increase and get in increase the hip joint and get more into the into the muscle structure uh, or potential muscle structure of it. Because um, up to then, I'm up to now, I've been kind of just thinking about sort of bone structure. Um, start to think of like well. How does this thing push off the ground? What shape is this? Is the is this sort of foot? It's probably got claws or something like that on it. Um, then I'm gonna have a really sort of narrow waist, and then get right into the rib cage. And I think what I'm gonna do with the rib cage is um, just sort of drop it to the ground. So it'll be this kind of like you know, hulking, grounded creature. So that rib cage now is basically just all the way on the ground. And I might need to move the hip a little bit. Might need to extend things. And then I got to, um, I think I'm going to have the spine kind of come down and have a low spine, sort of like a horse and have the head kind of come off of that. And I'm going to change the angle of the head again. Change the shape of it. Maybe I'll change the head shape more towards that. And I think what I need to do is move this guy over or actually increase my canvas size. Make the width about um, a little bit longer. So now I can kind of have room to work on this head. And we'll go ahead and zoom in on this guy. Give me more room to work with. nice thing about working digitally is that you can add to your paper. If you're working analog, you can still add to your paper. Um, you just need to do it by actually putting another piece of paper behind it, which I've done so many times, especially throughout school. So here I'm going to have this foot coming out kind of real close. 
down at the bottom and you know I'll find an eye socket and now that this rib cage is looking really close to the ground this guy I think is a shoveler right so what I've kind of drifted onto is that I have created an exaggeration and um, I was using a shape based exaggeration by just forcing the rib cage to the bottom of this and that exaggeration actually suggested a movement right and so now I know that this guy like has real short stumpy legs he runs big powerful back legs so that means that his motion is really low to the ground and um, I wound up putting the spine really low because I wanted the neck to kind of be low to the ground but now what I need now what I'm thinking like what I need to do is have a big fat neck tendon you know so all of this up here is like um, tendon attachments that that attaches to the top of the head and um, that attachment basically means that it's gonna have a real powerful sort of upward head motion that's possible because of this fat tendon and this tendon is going to attach all the way up to the to the sort of um, s you know what would be the seventh cervical vertebrae on a human sort of the back of the the top of the rib cage um, and that means that this thing can pick its head up real fast and if it's going to pick its head up real fast then it has to have tusks um, because that's just cool um, and tusks are basically just, you know, triangles. If you want something to be monstrous and scary, you just make triangles, right? So um, I'm gonna take these these tusks and kind of oversize them, probably. They don't have to be big for the shoveler to be super effective. It's gonna have kind of a rounded point because it's a tusk. And I'll probably hint at the fact that there's another one back there, just kind of indicate it rather than fully develop it. And then I can just kind of play with the eyes and find out where the eyes should be. Should they be back? Should they be forward? Um, thinking they should kind of be about here. Let's start giving this some this some emphasis. I can change up the head shape. Kind of liking what happened here, where there's this little dip in the skull. And I like that it got a little flat and is kind of coming back in this stubby, almost turtle-like way. So here, I think I've kind of found the eye a little bit better. Um, so then I need to find uh, a little more jaw, so there's like a little bit of a jaw opening. I want to keep the jaw short because the, uh, the muscles need to attach so I can maybe indicate like, where that jaw is lightly. Then I need to uh, modify the bottom of it, change the shape up. So now I'm getting into the stage where I'm really developing um, some detail about this monster. And uh, you know, for an idea sketch, I don't want to go past here, but um, I think just for the sake of um, you know an actual full design, we can take it further. Um, and I can just add more layers, add more detail to it, and uh, and go from there. So I can start to say, well, you know, this is this is going to be a shoulder, and if it's going to shovel stuff, it probably needs at least a relatively powerful shoulder. So I can start to round that out. I can start to think about, you know, how shoulder muscles work and adapt, and maybe we'll potentially layer on top of this stuff. You know, I always have to think about joints, too, and how these joints um, change and adapt. And I also need to think about, you know, what's the front side of all this stuff? What's the, uh, how is this layering up? And then I can think of, well, you know, this is going to be a foot. You know, maybe it's got, like, a foot pad here. And then maybe it does have a couple of like claws that it can like sort of claw at things. So 
that's getting sort of fun. And then I've got some of the neck developed, but then maybe it's got like this sort of flesh that hangs down. I think it's going to have quite a bit of like extra padding here. And then I can think of, well, how does this, um, how does this muscular all kind of attach? The muscu muscular structure all kind of attached, so maybe there's a muscle that comes along uh, back and into the armpit, wrapping around. Maybe there's another layer of muscle back here. Probably going to be another layer of muscle that wraps around here, too. So I can start to think of where that's going to go, how that's going to interact. And here I'm still just working on the side, right? So I can focus in on on this on the shape. You know, if I really want to get super sophisticated with all of this stuff, I can start to work from a corner. Then there's got to be a muscle that sort of comes around and wraps. And I can also double up, do double duty with muscles like this because then I'm also using this to describe form because if I'm taking a basic cylinder, which is sort of what this guy is, an organic cylinder, I'm going ahead and I'm wrapping these muscles around, right? So I'm coming off and wrapping around and that's helping me describe the, the chest of this guy. I want to be careful about where these things overlap, right? I don't want to head right directly into a joint. Do want sort of a flattish section on the bottom here. So that's coming along. This section can kind of pinch as I lead into the hip joint here. This hip joint's going to have to be pretty muscular for this to work. So I can again think of how are these muscles attaching and how are they layering up. And I can use similar ones to the front. I just make them slightly different shapes, um, resize them a little bit. Okay, so now I'm getting to the point where I've got a really pretty epic monster design going. And give the, you know, the back feet just a slightly different sort of approach. And again, I'm eliminating the the foot on the far side because you know, for the design phase, I don't necessarily need it. Um, I can bring that in if I turn it, because what I really want to do is just figure out one side, right? Um, it's sort of like if you're drawing any any kind of object, if you figure out one side, you can turn it figure out the front, uh, and then you can do a three-quarter view. So here I basically have a more or less like fully developed um, monster design idea. You know, it's missing things like textures and, and lighting and so on, but um, I think I've figured out all of, the, all of the details about this particular monster. What I would want to do from here is to uh, finish, polish, do some lighting, and uh, get some stuff going as far as, as how the, the skin is textured. And I can pull any kind of skin texture on here that I want to. Um, I could maybe make this guy sort of, uh, you know, bring something reptilian into it. And I could uh, start to add in, you know, um, lines that sort of, that sort of cross all this stuff. And I can start to say, well, here, maybe he's got, um, you know, scales that actually go out and kind of overlap each other.
got these big like armor plate kind of scale thing. And what I can do that's nice here is I can change my layer opacity down, which is fun. And that can make the top layer more, um, more obvious, which is good for teaching purposes, but also for design purposes. So here I need to break some scales and let them go out because the scales are kind of going around the form and out. So it's almost like uh, they're almost like sort of flowers. So now I can go back and kind of draw these uh, diamond pattern sort of things back in space, just continuing to overlap them. And again, just following the form that I set up. If you've done your texture practice well, then this stuff should be pretty easy because it's not really any different than anything uh, anything else um, that you would put a texture on. You're just doing it in an organic way and applying it on top of a particular monster rather than um, an abstract shape or anything. You know, then I can get into things like um, I can put a layer between um, I can increase my brush size significantly. I can go in with a slightly different value and I can start to um, I'll need a big brush here. Yeah. I can get in there and I can start to uh, do some value work. And I can put the value work under under the, the bottom of the whole thing, which is always kind of fun. So I preserve all my lines. Um, I enjoy doing this because it, uh, it's like working with a pen and watercolor pencil. So I think that's a good way to, to sort of fake it is, um, you know, you can do this approach digitally, but if you're working analog, it's not really any different. And, and the way I've done it in the past is just um, use a pen, finish out a drawing, get it all developed, and then come back with a watercolor pencil. And then the pen stays where it is. The watercolor pencil adds uh, adds value. You can use you can use uh, water and bleed it around, and uh, it all kind of works out. So here I'm still preserving, you know, what I'm doing with the texture, but adding in this big shadow core and starting to light this guy out. Yeah. Then I can come back into, if I need to figure out a layer, I can just turn it off and on again. I can come back and uh, you know, decrease my brush size again, back to, where it, back to where it was. I can pick my dark value. I can have a few layers of value if I want. I can um, add in a, a deep shadow value, because I know that right along here I'm probably going to want um, want some of these uh, scales to have some deep shadows, especially along the shadow core. And what's cool is if I um, treat this as like a separate layer in Photoshop, um, then I can turn that layer off and on and change the opacity of it if I need to. That's just the coolest thing about working digitally is that you have all these options about how to how to draw differently than you than you might have in the past. And I think that's really fun. That's what I enjoy about it. Um, and it makes it easier to make certain kinds of changes. I think as a learning tool, um, this can be really difficult um, because you don't have the, uh, you don't always have the hand-eye coordination aspect of it, um, especially if you don't have a tablet display. I'm fortunate enough to have one. So there we go. And I think um, I can do things like I can change these layers and I can change the blend mode of these layers and I can layer one on top of the other. So if I change the blend mode, that's going to look more like um, 
more like traditional media if I use uh, if I use various blend modes. Uh, that'll make things um, easier to deal with. So there we go. Um, so this is kind of your demo about how to develop your monster idea and then begin to um, to texturize it. So um, that should be enough to go on as far as as completing uh, several monster designs. Um, you know, on the initial stages, doing a bunch of the small shape studies is going to be great. Um, on the later stages, just picking your favorite three or four to develop, I think is going to be um, the best approach.